All right, I am back with another build, and today we're doing a what if build for Shadowheart. Well, I say it's a what if build, but I would also say this is my Shah deity build. I wasn't going to do a Shah deity build as part of the regular series because I technically have already done one. My original Shadowheart origin build had multiple routes that you could go down, whether you're going to be the Chosen of Saluna or the Chosen of Shah, and so I kind of had it already there. But I did end up doing a Saluna video anyway, so I've decided to do a Shah video. But I really wanted to do this what if Shadowheart build anyway. And for the record, yes, I know her hair is white. I'm not playing through the whole game again just for a single video thank you uh <laughs> but anyways uh for this build i wanted to look at shadow hearts ending by the way spoilers for act two and three here click off the video in three two one spoilers begin now uh, I wanted to do a build based on Shadowheart becoming the Mother Superior, about her finding out the truth about her past but still siding with Shah, basically with what happened with the Night Song in Act 2, she kills them and then goes on to kill Viconia de Vere, uh, as a Dark Justitia, like subsiding her and becoming the Mother Superior in her place, taking over the Sharon Cloister in Act 3. So that's why you can kind of see we have the robes of the Mother Superior here, which are dyed in black and jade and Oh my god, they look amazing. I will say, trying to get decent fashion uh, for this robe was a bit tricky, especially with the boots. The boots are a little bit off, but I figured Viconia was a drow, so taking the drow boots kind of makes sense. Uh, but overall, I just absolutely love the design. But regardless, that's neither here nor there. So yeah, the ending that we're working with here is Shadowheart becoming the Mother Superior and Viconia Devere not being in the picture. Shadowheart kills her. Uh, and obviously, you know, stays within Shah's good graces at the end of the day. So this is an evil run for Shadowheart, but I don't necessarily think Shadowheart herself would be wholly evil in this ending. I think she just would have stuck to her Shah and roots, continued to run the cloister. Her herself maybe not being completely evil, but definitely obviously the Shah and faith and all that. Do some pretty evil shit from time to time, and I definitely think Shadowheart would probably facilitate that. So it's an interesting character. Like, don't get me wrong, she would absolutely fight on the with the forces of good at the end of the day with her friends. Uh, at, if push came to shove, but maybe her methods of getting to the good side of things may not always be exactly aligning with the good, if that makes sense. Uh, the other thing I will say about this build is I would say you probably don't want to make this right off the bat. As soon as you start at 1, you're probably not going to want to start building this right away, and let me explain as the combat footage is kind of playing. I think you want to play this build if you're playing through Shadowheart throughout the game, Origin, Companion, whatever, you're going to want to just play a pure Trickery Cleric to get the full roleplay value and all that up until the end of Act 2, when you're going to be level 6, 7, maybe 8. That is when you're going to respec into this build. So throughout the video, kind of just take into account that I have re that I would suggest respecing at a later level in order to get the results that you see here. Uh, as well as we are going to be doing some item shenanigans with this build that I normally wouldn't do, but it was kind of the only way to get the stats work in a way that I was happy with uh, and allowing me to use all the equipment that I wanted to use with this build. Uh, you'll see what I mean as we get into it, but without further ado, let's get in to the build. We're actually going to be kicking things off as a sorcerer. Like I said, if you are respecting this later in the in your run, you're not going to have so much of an issue of like, oh, which class to start with, blah, 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 blah. You will still pretty much have everything by the time you're kind of at the right level. So like I say, you're respecting at a later level. So starting off with sorcerer is going to get us a few things. Number one is going to get us concentration saving throw proficiency, which we absolutely want because this build is going to be a bit concentration heavy. Uh, for your subclass, you can choose whatever you Want. Uh, you can go with Draconic Bloodline if you want an extra element, I uh, want an extra spell of some kind, uh, and as well as not having to use Mage Armor to get your Unarmored Defense, because we are obviously wearing a robe, we do want Unarmored Defense with this build. Wild Magic could also work, but I don't really think it fits the vibe of the build very well, so I've decided to go with Storm Sorcerer. Storm Sorcerer is going to give us a ton of things that I quite like. It'll give us all the usual utility stuff that Sorcerer would give us, but it also gives us the ability to fly as a bonus action after casting a spell. And I don't know, that kind of felt right for this build. It feels powerful. It feels like you are this like religious leader with some sort of divine power, just being able to fly around. I don't know, I felt like it seemed pretty cool. However, I will say, if you want to build this slightly differently, maybe swapping out Dexterity and Constitution, and you don't care about using a shield, because we are using a shield with this build, so you, instead of Sorcerer, do Monk. Because Monk is going to give you Unarmored Defense using your Wisdom, which we're going to be leveling Cleric, so that's going to work for us anyway, as well as the fact that you would be able to use our Spear, which you can see on the back of Shadowheart there, you would be able to use your Dexterity with that, meaning that you won't need to use 
Potions of Hill Giant Strength, which I'll get into in a minute, to make the spear work. Because yes, I am using Potions of Hill Giant Strength in this build, and I'll get into my justification for that in a minute. Otherwise, let's keep going. My personal recommendation is Storm Sorcery, but you could also go with Monk here. As for our cantrips, I decided to kind of just take some utility options here. Uh, we've got friends. Obviously, a Sharon would absolutely have friends. You know, the whole mind manipulation type deal. It's kind of their thing. Light is just there to be a source of light for whatever reason you may you may desire. You could potentially use this for radiating orb shenanigans if you wanted to go down that route. But otherwise, I'm not really too worried about it. Uh, next up, Mage Hand, just a great utility spell to have, no reason not to take it. And finally, Minor Illusion. Of course we're going to take Minor Illusion, we're a trickery god cleric person, we definitely want Minor Illusion. Next up for our spells, we're just going to take the standard Sorcery Utility Kit. Mage Armor, because we kind of need it, again, we're using Mage Armor to get our unarmored, unarmored defense on our robes, again, you won't need to take this if you go for something else. As well as Shield, because of course we're going to take Bloody Shield, I mean, come on, it's one of the best spells in the game. Next up for our ability scores, strength is going to be at 8 because yes we are using potions of hill giant strength because I wanted this build to feel powerful like Shadowheart is at the height of her power like she's fully embraced Shah and now that benefit is paying off, Shah has given her a ton of power and I would call like maybe reflavoring the uh like what you call it the potions maybe as like some sort of divine elixir maybe the tears of Shah or the blessing of Shah or something which gives her incredible strength so by the time you've kind of gotten into late act two you've probably stocked up on quite a few hill giant strength potions that you can use on shadow heart here but again if you want to take those monk levels and swap dexterity and constitution around because we'll have a lot of ways of getting advantage of this build with this build so you probably don't need dexterity if you're going that route to be higher than 16 anyway uh, or, or at the very least you could have wisdom and dexterity both be at 18 uh because you'll have so many ways of getting advantage with this build it's insane so you're pretty much going to be hitting all the time and we'll have ways of augmenting our damage anyway so we don't really need the highest weapon stat modifier in the world uh, but I'd still have it around 16 if you're going down that route. Otherwise, if you really, really want to feel strong and you don't mind that extra bit of resource, man resource management throughout your campaign playthrough, then go with 8 Strength and bump that up with a Potion of Hill and then eventually Cloud Giant Strength. Next up, Dexterity is at 14. This is going to be just enough to give us a decent amount of armor class, uh, as well as all the other stuff we could kind of want here. Next up, Constitution. I kind of preferred having more Constitution than Dexterity here, because I kind of like the idea of having better concentration saves and more HP overall. But if you want to swap Dexterity and Constitution around, you absolutely can. Intelligence is at 8, because we don't need it. Wisdom is at 16, because we are going to primarily be a spellcaster at the end of the day. Yes, our Spear is going to be a very viable option, and in fact, a very powerful viable option, but we're not going to be getting anything like extra attack with this Spear. So you're only going to be using your big one-off attack once per turn, uh, but don't worry, that one attack will usually be enough. But we are mainly a spellcaster here because, again, I wanted to stick to those trickery cleric roots. So we're going to be mainly focusing on wisdom here. As such, it's starting at 16. And charisma is at 12. Again, a Sharon is all about manipulation and all that sort of thing. So I feel like having at least a little bit of charisma is going to be great. We're also going to have ways of buffing up our spell save DC. So if you did end up taking an offensive cantrip or spell with this one level dip of sorcerer, then you could potentially get some usage out of it. But for the purposes of what we're doing with this build between friends, eventually Thaumaturgy, as well as this little bit of charisma and such like that, you're going to be just fine in dialogue, which again will be perfect for a Sharon character. Next up for our uh, skills, Shadowheart obviously comes with a uh, it comes with the Acolyte background, meaning we're going to have Religion and Insight by default, as well as we're going to have Deception and Persuasion, because again, that just made sense. We won't be getting Intimidation with this build, but obviously we'll have ways of bumping that up with, again, Friends, friends and Formaturgy. Next up, we're going to be immediately leaving Sorcerer. Now, you can take... If you wanted to kind of take like cleric level for cleric levels first and then level up into this other multi-class in a little while, you absolutely could. But I'm going to be showing off the kind of level order from least to greatest amount of levels. And besides, you are going to be respecking into this build at a later level. So it's not really going to matter the level order you choose. In fact, I would probably recommend taking cleric last in that case just for item spell save DC and all of that sort of thing, because this game is weird about how that works. I'm hoping that gets changed in patch 7, but who knows? I mean, it's not far away now. September's getting closer and closer. Oh, that means the summer is almost over and I'll have to go back to work. No, but regardless, doesn't matter. Back to the build. We're going Paladin. So Paladin is going to give us a few things. Again, I wanted this build to feel powerful, like you were challenging, channeling the direct divine energy of Shah into your strikes. And as such, we're going to be picking up Paladin to get just that with Divine Smite. It's going to give us a bunch of other things that are actually going to be really useful for us as well, like full martial weapon proficiency, which we are going to need for certain things later. But 
Regardless, I really did want to pick this up here, so let's get into it. As for your subclass, uh, it's entirely up to you kind of what you want to use here. Oh, for devotion, if you want to say that shot, that sh shot, yes, shot is completely devoted to charm, uh, you could go with that. Oh, for vengeance. Maybe, I don't know. In my testing, I actually went with Oathbreaker because we're only taking two levels of Paladin here and I felt like the level one ability of Oathbreaker Paladin was probably the best one of the bunch. So uh, I'm gonna go do a crime real quick. Be right back. So here's an interesting bug. When I broke my oath, Shadowheart's black hair came back. Well, I know how I'm going to do the thumbnail now. Anyways, we're gonna get Spiteful Suffering at first level of Oathbreaker Paladin, allowing us to deal extra necrotic damage to an enemy and Attack rolls against it have advantage for three turns at the cost of our channel Oath. I went for a kind of necrotic damage feel with this build, like necrotic and poison, because again, we're a Sharon, trickery and poison are kind of their thing with trickery cleric, as well as throwing in that extra necrotic damage just kind of felt right. So we're going to be getting a little bit of that here. I'm not sure if I prefer Shadowheart with the black hair or the white hair with this look. I like the black hair color with, the, with this hairstyle. I think it looks nice. I don't know, let me know what you guys think. Anyways, back to your reg regularly scheduled programming. Next up at Paladin level two, obviously we're gonna be getting Divine Smite, which is what we're mainly here for. We're also gonna gain access to some Paladin spells as well as a fighting style. Now, if you don't care about using a shield, perhaps you went down the monk route, you are maybe gonna to wanna to pick up great weapon fighting here. Uh, you could also pick up defense if you want a little bit more armor class, but that's only while wearing armor. So unless you decide to stick with the early game equipment I'm gonna show off, uh, you might probably don't want this. And protection, uh, you're going to pick Dueling. So Dueling is going to give you the ability to do a little bit more damage with our Spear while it's in one hand, and it will do that because we're going to be uh, using a Shield with this build. Next up, you do get to prepare some spells, and again, we will have access to the Smite spells actually pretty nicely, so I'm going to say let's grab those. Searing Smite for a bit of Fire, Thunderous Smite for a bit of Thunder, and the ability to knock targets prone, kind of fitting with the Storm Source Revive a bit, and Wrathful Smite, allowing us to frighten our targets and deal psychic damage. This one feels the most on theme, because again, I feel like instilling fear into your opponents is something a Sharon would absolutely do. Again, that mental manipulation, especially since Trickery Cleric does get fear later on, so I do feel like this makes sense to pick up here, so I want to pick it up. Well, we're three levels into this build, or four levels I should say, so we're finally going to be making the jump over to Cleric for the rest of our levels. As a Cleric, we're going to gain access to a few cantrips, and I'm going to take these social cantrips for now, that being Thaumaturgy, Guidance, and Resistance. Of course, we're going with Trickery Domain because I want to stay on theme here. If you want to pick something else, you can. But come on, let's do Trickery Cleric. I mean, I know people don't like Trickery Cleric because the basic features are kind of meh. But if I'm being honest, the spell selection you get from Trickery Cleric is absolutely worth it. It makes the class a ton of fun. Uh, obviously, like I say, some of the like the basic features can be a bit iffy and not always work the way you want them to. They could do with a buff in reality, I don't know. But I do really think that the extra spells you're going to get are going to feel great for this build. So let's get into those. First up, we are going to get Blessing of the Creature. Uh, Blessing of the Creature, Blessing of the Trickster. Granting another creature, that's why I messed that up, advantage on stealth checks. Helpful for the rogue in the party. Next up, we're also going to get Charm Person and Disguise Self as part of our Trickery Domain spells. Charm Person is okay. I mean, we do have um, friends for this sort of thing, but this can work in combat, I believe. So I would actually say that this would be perfectly appropriate to have on this build. In fact, if I didn't take, if it didn't get added to us immediately, I would probably just take it anyway. We also get Disguise Self, which is just an amazing spell to have. Definitely keeping that one around. Next up for our spells, we're going to want to pick a couple here. I'm definitely going to say Sanctuary is very, very important here. It's one of the best utility spells in the game. Absolutely want to pick it up. It's great for survivability. Shield of Faith could be cool, but we're actually going to get this from the robe anyway. And um, it, But if you want to take it so you have more casts of Shield of Faith, you absolutely can because it does trigger some features but otherwise i would just leave it here command we're absolutely taking it just makes sense mental manipulation again it makes sense for a sharon to take command as well as i would say grab both guiding bolt and and inflict wounds inflict wounds is going to allow us to deal with necrotic damage which again is a theme of this build as well as guiding bolt is going to allow us to fire a big bolt of radiant damage making it so our next attack roll against that target has advantage or an attack roll from a party member this still is going to work with a team quite nicely even if shadow heart isn't as much of a team player with this particular act 
All right, at Cleric Level 2, we're going to gain access to a few things, namely our channel Divinity, which is going to allow us to turn undead, and use Invoke Duplicity. Invoke Duplicity is going to allow us to distract our enemies with an illusion. While we're within three meters of said illusion, attack rolls have advantage for you and your allies, which is great. So if we just place ourselves next to the illusion, we're going to get advantage on attack rolls. As a paladin, we like that a lot. And both attacker and creature, but the thing is, is both the attacker and the creature must be within three meters. And unfortunately, it takes your concentration, it lasts 10 turns, it costs your channel Divinity, and if it get hits and if it gets hit once once it's gone this is why people don't like trickery cleric however like i say the spell selection is absolutely worth it and i do find this is great for opening combat as usually invoke duplicity won't trigger enemies aggro in fact it'll just distract them a bit similar to minor illusion so you could absolutely open up with like a stealth uh, divine smite or have a starry and jump in with his roguish sneak attack and be absolutely fine so it can help a little bit so you just got to be a bit more creative Next up, we do get to choose another spell, and I think I'm going to just grab the bog standard healing spell, Cure Wounds. Uh, because, and I'll give you the justification for Cure Wounds, because, you know, we're going to be torturing people, but we need to get information out of them, so we're going to heal them and then torture them again. Because we're kind of screwed up. Anyways, next up for Cleric Level 3, we're going to gain access to Level 2 spells. Uh, I would say we're going to, well, we are going to be getting Trickery Domain Spells, Mirror Image, and Pass Without Trace, two amazing spells. Mirror Image is one of the best spells in the game for utility as far as I'm concerned. It is a great defensive spell, making it so at least for a couple of turns you can guarantee you're not going to be hit by direct attack rules, which is absolutely amazing. A Pass Without Trace is just great for the whole party, giving everyone advantage on stealth checks. It's great outside of combat, so I would absolutely recommend picking this one up. But we also have level 2 spells here, and it's up to you really what you want to pick. I'm going to be going with Blindness to start, and I might actually drop Cure Wounds for Silence. So we've got Silence, making it so that we can make it so enemies cannot cast spells, and Blindness, allowing us to blind a creature so that attack rolls have advantage and they attack with disadvantage. Like, it's so good. I love Blindness. The fact that it doesn't take our concentration so it's free to cast on a bunch of different enemies is honestly amazing. And these two spells together just feel perfect for this build. At Cleric Level 4, we're going to gain access to a cantrip. Uh, I would say probably pick either Produce Flame or Sacred Flame, whatever strikes your fancy. We already have a lot of sources of Radiant Damage, so I'm going to go with Produce Flame because the blue flame on this outfit would look sick. Anyways, next up for our prepared spell, you could choose something else, but I'm absolutely grabbing Hold Person because, again, it just makes sense. And finally, we do get to pick up another feat. Now, again, we're getting our first feat quite late into the build, which is why I'm recommending this as a late game respec. As you can see, we are at level 7, which is about the level I would I would suspect you get to the end of Act 2, where this change in Shadowheart might start to occur, so I would imagine you would probably start to respec into this build here and now. Anyway, so this should be fine for progression. Like I say, just play a, play a pure Trickery Cleric up until that point. Of course, we're bumping up our Wisdom to get the most out of our spell save DC. Next up, at Cleric Level 5, we're going to get Destroy Undead, you already know what that does, and we get some more Trickery Domain spells. We're going to get Bestow Curse, which again, just feels great for a build like this, as well as Fear, like I said, making it so targets have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls, and they drop their weapons and such like that. It is pretty damn cool, but of course, level 3 spells on a Cleric means spirit guardians which we can use in the necrotic damage variant to just get a ton of damage off we're going to be running in with our spear as well because we're going to have many many ways to deal additional damage so if we run in with spirit guardians hit him with a divine smite that's also going to get buffed by divine strike which we're going to get in a minute you're going to do absolutely massive amounts of damage as well as we do get to pick another spell here and at this point i kind of like just picking up mass healing word because you never know when that extra little pick me up could be helpful there's a lot of spells i would like to take on this build so you're going to have to mix and match and see exactly what you want to pick up. Aid is also great. A warding Bond could be good. Glyph of Warding would make a lot of sense for this build. Honestly, these are all prepared spells, so you can mix and match them as you're liking. This is kind of, just kind of the set that I personally want. Next up at Cleric Level 6, we're getting another Channel Divinity Charge, which means another Invoke Duplicity. Yay. We're also going to gain access to Channel Divinity Cloak of Shadows, allowing us to become invisible if we are obscured. It only lasts for two turns, which means it's not really as good as, like, the invisibility spell itself. But, hey, we might as well take it. It's not going to use our spell slots, and you never know when it could come in handy. Ne and then we also do get to pick another spell at this point. Just take whatever you like. It really doesn't matter. 
Next up, at Cleric Level 7, we're going to gain access to Level 4 spells, including including two pretty good spells for Trickery Domain. Polymorph, which is going to allow, it to, allow us to transform a creature into a harmless sheep, very trickster-esque, as well as Dimension Door, allowing us to teleport around the map, bringing an ally with us as well. All in all, two pretty damn useful utility options. Next up, we do gain access to Level 4 spells overall, but I don't really find that any of these Level 4 spells here appeal to me necessarily. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're all good, and especially things like Guardian of Faith, which would obviously just be good on most builds anyway, but I kind of like to pick up something else here, uh, maybe one of the lower level options. I could easily see a couple of different things. Animate Dead could be good. You know, you have a few options. I did say about Glyph of Warding earlier though, so I'm gonna take that here. Next up at Cleric Level 8, we're going to get Divine Strike Poison, adding an extra, an extra D8 of poison damage to a weapon attack once per turn. Fun fact though, this also works on reaction attacks, because it's technically outside of your turn, so if an enemy tries to move away from you, your, your attack of opportunity will apply for Divine Strike Poison damage, meaning you can technically get it off twice, once on your turn and once in between your turn, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, but overall, it is just going to be a bit of extra damage, like I say, Spirit Guardian's damage, on top of damage we're going to get from our equipment, on top of Divine smite damage plus this you're going to be dealing massive amounts of damage in a single strike next up we do get to choose another spell and it's entirely up to you what you pick we're also going to get another feat here as well and i want to max out that wisdom And finally, at Cleric level 9, we're going to get access to 5th level spells, as well as the 5th level Trickery Domain spells, which I absolutely wanted for this build. And because we have enough levels in a full spellcaster and half spellcasters, we are getting our level 6 spell slot here, which is going to feel really nice. But for our Trickery Domain spells, we are going to get access to Dominate Person, which is just perfect for a Sharon build. I had to get this on the build somehow. And we will have multiple ways of using it, but this is but it's nice to just have it as part of our main spell list. Anyway, Dominate Person is going to allow us to completely dominate the, the humanoid to fight alongside us, meaning that then they have to succeed wisdom saving throws against the domination. Uh, this is just the full-on Sharon coming out. This is Shah's direct divine influence, allowing us to completely mind control someone. Also, we get seeming, which is just a lot of fun anyway. We also do get access to other level 5 spells, and it's entirely up to you what you want to bring here. I would personally recommend bringing Flame Strike, because come on, how often do we get to take Flame Strike in a build? Dealing fire and radiant damage is just fun, and it's nice to have a non concentration option that's going to do big damage. Again, we are primarily a spellcaster at the end of the day, so I do want to get big damage options, and Flame Strike covers a lot of different areas. And of course, I want Contagion, allowing us to poison a target and afflict them with various different, completely debilitating status conditions. I love Contagion. Agent. I'm so glad we could get it on this build, and it's one of the main reasons I wanted to get to level 9 of Trickery Cleric. But if you feel like these things aren't very important to you, then drop down a level of Trickery Cleric and pop that either into, I would say, Paladin if you want the level 3 features, which could be very useful. Maybe if you're going over Vengeance, you could go with that for like Abjure Enemy or something like that. Uh, or maybe pop it into that level of Monk instead, keeping the Sorcerer level, but also getting the Monk level for the Dexterity shenanigans. Honestly, it's entirely up to you. The character camera's gonna fly off. Yep, I'm not a bunch. Grr, I hate the camera. And that is the build. Overall, what you're gonna be getting out of this is a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Uh, it just, and I mean just, fits on the hotbar. Anyways, <laughs> uh, you're gonna be getting a ton of stuff out of this build: healing, melee damage, spell damage, a ton of utility and versatility, battlefield control, ways to support your allies, way to just go completely solo. Basically, all of your stats are pretty damn optimized as well. You've got a maxed out spellcasting modifier. You've got decent constitution. With the potions of heal giant strength, you're going to have pretty decent strength and dexterity and everything across the board. The only stat that you're going to have a bit of problems with is intelligence. Otherwise, everything else is going to work out greatly for you. So this is going to be great if you want to play Shadowheart as an origin character. Uh, but like I say, you've also got a pretty decent selection of spells here. Tons of ways of getting advantage, tons of ways of dealing out extra damage. You get things like Hold Person, which is always great. You know, Flame Strike is always fun to have. Like, I don't know, I just really like this build overall. You've got the absolutely massive damage options with things like Divine Smite being absolutely huge. And remember, Divine Smite does not scale past level 4 spell slots, so don't feel like you need to waste your high level spell slots on this. Level 4 is the maximum. And yeah, we just have a ton of cool stuff here. Let's just turn you back around, Shadowheart. I don't know why the game tried to censor something there. That was a bit strange. <laughs> this video is a bit scuffed today, but that's okay. When aren't my videos scuffed? But anyways, as like I said, you just have a ton of stuff to work with here, but let's get into the rest of the build. 
namely the equipment. Now, obviously, we've got some very obvious choices here, but maybe one or two things here might surprise you. First up, we have Shah's Spear of Evening. Of course, if we're going to be the Chosen of Shah, we need to have Shah's Weapon. Shah's Spear of Evening is going to come with a bunch of extra damage on it. I mean, look at it. We also have Shah's Blessing. You gain advantage on saving throws while being lightly or heavily obscured. And this weapon deals an additional 1d6 damage to creatures that are lightly or heavily obscured. So, if you're fighting in darkness, which this weapon can create in multiple different ways, uh, you're going to be dealing a lot of damage with this weapon. You're also immune to being blinded, so you get Darkness, Devil Shite, Shite, <laughs> Devil Shite. Uh, can you tell I'm trying to record this video quickly? Because I have to, like, be gone in, like, 25 minutes. I have to leave the house in 25 minutes. Ah, I better hurry this up. Anyways, the wearer cannot be blinded, meaning you can do Darkness and Devil Sight shenanigans. I nearly did it again. Uh, with just in a single weapon, which is great. It's a plus three legendary weapon. Absolutely amazing. As well as we're going to get the ability to cast Shah's Darkness once per turn. It will cast our concentration, cost our concentration, but we basically have access to the Darkness spell ad infinium with this build, which is amazing. We also have access to Edge of Darkness, which will create a cloud of darkness while dealing extra damage. Uh, it basically does a big attack once per short rest, but it does create a non-concentration cloud of darkness, which we can take advantage of. Honestly, an amazing weapon. We also have access to Viconia's Walking Fortress, which is going to give us, which which just makes sense for this build. I mean, we killed Viconia, took her place, we might as well use her gear. Uh, the Viconia's Walking Fortress is a plus three legendary shield, which is absolutely amazing. One of the only ones in the game. As well as it's going to give us access to a bunch of cool and unique things. We're going to get Rebuke of the Mighty, which means whenever... We, which is basically the regular shield bash, but it also does an extra 2 to 8 force damage, which is really nice. We're also going to gain advantage on saving throws against spells, and spell attack rolls will have disadvantage against us, making us a very, very tanky against spell casters, but it gets even better. We gain access to Reflective Shell, formerly a Elifid power in early access, now turned into a unique ability for this shield. For two turns, once per short rest, as a bonus action, any projectiles targeted at us fire back at the person who fired them. That is very, very cool. It's a very unique ability that is going to make this build feel unique, fun, and powerful. We also did get access to Warding Bond here, so you didn't really need to take it as part of your cleric spells. Uh, but of course, these are late game options. Uh, Shah's Spear of Evening is the end of Act 2, and Vaconia's Walking Fortress can be as early as the start of Act 3, so you're probably going to want to get some early game options, and boy do I have some. The classic cleric option, the Blood of Lathander, will work quite nicely for us here. It's just a great app option that you could pick up in Act 1 that's going to work out for you all the way until the late game when you can pick up the, sp sh the, the, the Spear of Darkness. Man, I should not record videos when I'm in a rush. <laughs> Once per long rest when your hit points are reduced to zero, you, you can immediately regain some hit points, and some and allies will regain hit points around you as well, meaning that you're able to get back up once per long rest when you're downed. You also can shed light around you as well, and fiends and undead standing in the light become blinded unless they succeed a con save. It's a plus three legendary mace. For some reason, it should be a morning star. I mean, look at its design. And you also get to cast sunbeam once per long rest. Overall, amazing early game weapon for you. you also, I would also recommend as an early game shield for Justitia's Great Shield, because of course before we could become the Mother Superior, we've got to become a Dark Justitia first, and of course that means getting the correct equipment. But Justitia's Great Shield is going to give you access to the Shield Bash, as well as Darkness Cloak, allowing you to create a cloud of mar magical darkness and immediately attempt to hide. Just fits perfectly on theme for the build, as well as giving you advantage on perception checks. And while we're talking about Justitia armor, let's just go over the early game equipment that I'm obviously going to recommend recommend for you the full Dark Justicia set. The Dark Justicia helmet is going to give you a plus one bonus to saving throws against spells, and while obscured, the number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one, this effect can stack. If this wasn't medium armor, I would be using this for the whole game, however it is, so I have an alternative. And of course, because we kill the Night Song in this run, we are going to gain access to the full Power Dark Justicia set, including the very rare variant of the Dark Justicia Heart Plate. Coming with a whopping 17 AC, plus your 2 Dexterity from Medium Armor, that's going to give you a Knight from Medium, from Dexterity I should say, that's going to give you a 19 AC overall, which is pretty damn good. While obscured, the wearer has advantage on stealth checks, which is absolutely amazing, as well as while you have Shield of Faith active, you reduce all incoming damage by 2, and reflect damage received back at the attacker, who takes 1d4 necrotic damage. You also have advantage on constitution saving throw checks, and you gain Shah's Aegis, which is going to cast Shield and Faith on you once per long rest. Overall, pretty damn good armor. That looks really good, I'll show you in a minute. In fact, actually, I'll show you it now. 
Because I also colored it in black and jade, and it actually looks really cool. It almost looks cyberpunky. It's really nice. We're also getting, getting access to the Dark Justicia uh, gauntlets, meaning that our, all of our weapon attacks will deal an additional 1d4 necrotic damage. We gain a plus one bonus to strength saving throws, and we gain access to Beckoning Darkness, which is going to allow us to uh, curse a creature to be haunted by darkness it'll take a bunch of necrotic damage and if it starts and if it enters or starts its turn or if it enters or starts its turn in a heavily obscured area so as long as you're creating those clouds of darkness you're going to be able to get even more necrotic damage off each turn which is awesome we're also going to gain access to the dark justicia boots which is going to grant us shadow teleportation once per short rest we can teleport to an obscured spot it's basically the same as the shadow monk feature but of course, once we've become the Mother Superior, we're going to want to have something a bit more elegant. As great as this armor is, I do want to switch over to Viconia's Priestess Robe, so we do need to switch to all clothing to make this build work. Does it technically make the build weaker? Eh, maybe, who knows. Let me just cast Mage Armor for you. Let me just cast Mage Armor to show- Ooh, look at the lightning crackle in that fun. Uh, just to show you the full AC, which will have 19 with this with this variant of the build, so about the same as the medium armor would have given us anyway. But anyway, let's get on to it. So, first up we have the Horns of the Berserker. You gain a plus 2 bonus to attack rolls when attacking creatures that have already taken damage. Uh, this could help patch up if you do decide to go with the dexterity route a bit, uh, whereas you will have a lower attacking score overall. Uh, otherwise, you don't have to worry about it too much with our 27 strength maximum or 21 strength, depending on your on your elixir of choice. Uh, but also, unarmed and melee attacks will deal an additional 2 necrotic damage as long as you don't have your full health. If you don't deal any damage this turn, you will take 1d4 necrotic at the end of your turn. So basically, it's just more necrotic damage. You can swap this else out for something else if you'd like. Next up, the Nymph Cloak, which is going to give us access to another casting of Dominate Person uh, once per long rest. If you decide not to take that ninth level of Trickery Cleric, this is another way of getting Dominate Person, so I would personally recommend having this around no matter what. But again, anytime we can cast an important spell for our build without having to spend a spell slot, we take it. Next up, the main thing of the build, Viconia's Priestess Robe. While obscured, the wearer has advantage on stealth checks, and Shield of Faith also grants you a plus two bonus to all saving throws, and we just get a flat plus one armor class bonus. Overall, pretty decent. Again, the fashion is absolutely on point, and again, Shadowheart does canonically wear this robe in the ending if she goes down the Mother Superior route, but I did want to give it her own sort of color, a little bit of extra flair. We've also got the Braces of Defense, which I've just realized don't work with the shield. One moment. Well, the Braces of Defense would still work if you went down the Monk route, in which you wouldn't be able to use a shield anyway. So, the Braces of Defense still can work. However, if you're using this exact setup with the potions and you want to still have a piece of clothing that I think works with the fashion, I definitely wanted to go with braces and not gloves. Then the Harakneer braces are probably our best bet. Yes, Shadowheart using Gif Yankee braces when she probably hasn't gotten over her racist bias or whatever. Probably doesn't work too much in a lore perspective, but again, for the fashion, I think it works quite nicely. Uh, you might just have to mess around with the coloring a bit. Uh, but you, this does give us a few things that I think work for the build. You're going to get to cast Mage Hand as a bonus action, which is cool. And also you're going to gain access to Telekinesis every short rest, which I actually think is going to fit quite nicely for this build. I don't know, I know it's not quite 100% in the purview of what exactly we're going for here, but I don't know. Telekinesis on this build just feels good to me. Shadowheart's kind of got that attitude where if she doesn't really want to deal with something, she will just Telekinesis throw someone into the bloody Chion Thar if she really wants to. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it does make sense, but otherwise, pick something else if you like. Next up, the Disintegrating Nightwalkers. Didn't really have another good pair of light boots that worked, but this is going to pre prevent us from being able to slip on grease or ice, being webbed, entangled, or ensnared, which does kind of make sense for this build, as again, we're heavily in we, we focus heavily on concentration, so we don't really want to be falling on our ass if we can help it, because that will break our concentration. It's also going to give us an access to Misty Step once per short rest, which is usually more than enough, and again, we took our, uh, we took our clothing here from a drow, it makes sense to grab some drow boots. Next up for our accessories we have the Amulet of the Devout giving us a plus two bonus to our spell save DC and an extra usage of channel divinity once per long rest. Overall pretty decent I mean I know I've been kind of using this one a lot lately but it is just one of the best amulets in the game and for this build it does make sense. Next up, the Poisoner's Ring. We are going to be doing poison damage with this build, it is kind of our thing, so I felt like getting Virulent Venom to make it so enemies become vulnerable to poison damage, so that we can do double damage with our Divine Strike. It feels pretty appropriate for the build, but feel free to change this up for something else if you like. Maybe the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel, if you want to cast some of your illusion and enchantment spells as a bonus action, you could absolutely do that. Next up, the Strange Conduit Ring. We're going to be concentrating pretty much constantly, and this is going to allow us to get a little bit more of an oomph out of our weapon 
attacks, giving us an extra d4 of psychic damage while concentrating. And again, since Sharon's all about manipulating the mind, I felt like psychic damage did make sense. Anyways, that is the build. Sorry this video is a little bit all over the place. Like I say, I'm trying to get this recorded before I have to go do something really quick. Uh, so, I, But I still wanted to make sure I got this video out for you guys because I wasn't able to get a video out, video out yesterday in the end. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there's not much else really to say about this build. It is overall pretty solid. Again, maybe not the most optimized thing in the world. Again, not getting an extra attack on a build that does kind of focus around a spear. Maybe a bit of a deal breaker for you guys. But, but, but again, I feel like this build is still primarily a spellcaster. The spear is just a nice extra way of doing things. And again, when you want to go in with the spear, you absolutely can. All of the damage stacking we do is going to make that single attack still feel very, very powerful. But again, you're still primarily a cleric. You're still kind of wanting to play the support, but and still primarily be be a spellcaster so don't feel like you need to rush in all the time but obviously you absolutely can if you want to and if you're really dead set against playing trickery cleric for this build and you want that a little bit of extra martial capability go with war cleric but honestly just play trickery cleric play something new for once play something that may make things a little bit less easy for you because honestly trick and i say less easy trickery cleric does come with some great stuff that can really bolster your playstyle. it comes with all the, some of the great battlefield control spells it comes with some fun stuff like polymorph just 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 try something new don't go with the popular opinion do what feels right to you but anyways there's not really much else for me to say here. I mean, the build is pretty damn nice. It feels great to play. Worked great in my solo testing at various different encounters. But like I say, it is a bit of a weird one because you've got to respec into it at a later level and you're going to want to have those hill giant po uh, potions on hand. Uh, the other thing, like I say, though, is if instead you do want to take that monk level, then this build would change a little bit. Maybe you want to finish with 18 dex, 18 wisdom, and go for something like that. It's entirely up to you. Uh, the monk the monk variant of this build could be quite fun, uh, but just be reminded, obviously, that you can't use a shield, so you might want to use the uh, braces of defense instead. Uh, but anyways, that is going to do it for me for today. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.